So I'm actually heading the indoor networks research at Nokia Bell Labs. And today I'm talking about the future of indoor. And why does indoor matter? Like today, we spend most of our time indoors. As a networking company, 80% of our traffic is actually generated indoors. So it makes sense to create a vision, where do we think that the indoor space will go? And before I start with the future, let's go back to the past. And I'm going actually way back in the past. So on the left-hand side, you actually see one of the first washing machines that was 1870. And it was still using muscle power. So we started inventing time-saving machines. And a lot of the development that you see indoors, if you look at it, it's actually time-saving machines. That's a washing machine in 1930. At that time, we spent about 47 minutes, a typical family, doing laundry every day. Today, it's 22 minutes. So we already made progress in there. The next thing that when people think about the future of indoor is smart homes. So this is also looking at the past. 1950, there was the push button manner where every light, every door, every window could be operated by the push of a button. And it had even clever things like there's a little bowl there. Uh, when it's raining, it fills up with water. It flips a switch, closes all the window to prevent rain damage. So a lot of the concepts of smart homes are actually already pretty old from the 50s. Then, of course, when the computer came along, we started to use computer control. And there was even in 1980 the first protocol that let those devices talk to each other, so the X10 protocol. You could set, for example, different profiles for weekdays, for weekends. The home world could be fully automated. But now we have this tradition here at this conference to have a raise of hands. Who was living in a smart home in 2000? So even 20 years later, it didn't really catch on. Then, of course, we moved on. There was the internet. We could get remote access to our smart home devices. And with the advent of the, smart, of the smartphone, actually, we had thousands of smart home devices that we could interface. Each came with their own app. There were platforms to aggregate those things. But still, the smart home did not take off. And now let's do a fast forward to today. So this is where we are now. So we have the thousands of cloud-connected smart home devices. And we have a voice interface. So I don't need to talk about voice because we had a very nice talk. So that's really did two things. The first thing is that it solved the interoperability problem. And the second thing is also that we see more cognition. We also see more autonomy happening in the smart home. So for example, today I don't go to if this, then that, and program all the profiles and whatever. I can just say, Alexa, I'm leaving. And for example, Alexa will ask me, typically when you leave, you shut the door, you turn down the lights, and you lock the door. Today you didn't lock the door, should I do this for you? So you don't need to manually program everything. The second thing is, it solves the interoperability problem. So we don't have thousands of apps that we need to go into, but I can just tell Google to tell my air conditioning that I'm feeling cold, and it will turn up the temperature. So now, the real question is, like, are there still any shortcomings? And uh, one of the things that is still a, a problem is, and that's again coming back to the voice interface design, many times I talk to my voice assist on a mobile device. So this might be a smartphone. This might be my Echo Dot. I'm basically going there and saying, hey, Google, uh, turn on the lights. Very simple question, but the thing is, it doesn't really know in which room that I am. It doesn't even know in sometimes in which room the light is. So it's very hard to create an intuitive user interface. It also doesn't know who I am with. So that means that if I say, uh, hey, G, play some music, um, you know, it doesn't know because I usually listen to a different type of music when I'm by myself or if I'm with my kids. So that means there's a lot of shortcomings still in the smart home. So it doesn't have the right context to really build the intuitive user interface. And now the question is, of course, what is next? And this is now my prediction. So what is next is ambient intelligence. So how I picture my smart home of the future, it's first of all, it is a safe place. So that means that we keep track of the health and well-being of the people inside the home. The second thing is things will just work magically. So if I carry my laundry basket into the room, 
the lights will go on. I don't need to talk to anybody. I don't need to flip a switch or something. And the third thing, coming back to those time-saving machines in the beginning, we will go much further than that. So at CES, there was a, a new machine, the, the Foldimate, that can fold the whole laundry in five minutes. Um, we may see more capable robots like this that perform more uh, advanced tasks for us. And also those, those home robots, those devices that help us save times, will have much better um, sensory capabilities. And for example, if I detect a fall or something doesn't seem right, I may be able to send one of those robots, for example, to check on the people inside the home. So I believe that also these machines will become part of that ambient intelligence. So this is the... The vision that, that we have, this is the future of indoor. What are the main components? So the first, of course, it starts all with sensing. I need to sense what's going on. I need to get the context of the people. I need to have a sense of people presence. I need to know where they are. I want to know who there is. I want to know what they are doing. And I also would like to get the sense of what they are typically doing, so the patterns that they have in their home. Based on that, I can start to predict the need of people and objects inside the building. I can start to automate actions. For example, when the robot moves down the hallway, I know that it will enter this room so I can open the door for the robot already. I can start to detect anomalies that usually in a conference room like this, nobody is lying on the floor. So maybe it's time to check on that person. And of course, there is a lot of, um, and connectivity is really important because lots of the sensors, the actuators, they will actually be mobile. And in, many, in most of the cases, they will be wirelessly connected. So I cannot have a spotty connection. I have to have a robust connection inside the whole building covering everything. And this is where I come to the future of indoor networks. That's how we see it. So first, we would like to give you seamless or seemingly infinite capacity. And today, for example, Nokia has a whole home Wi-Fi product, which is uh, one of the best performing in the industry. And we can cover your whole home with a few hundred megabits per second. So that we can already do today. When I talk about seemingly infinite, I'm talking about uh, I would like to give you gigabit connectivity in your, inside your whole home. And it's not just gigabit connectivity. What I want to enable you is to consume immersive multimedia services. I also want to enable those home robots to perform the complex tasks. In many cases, they will actually have a an edge cloud where a lot of the brain of that home robot will be sitting. And that means that I have to do that gigabit connectivity in less than five milliseconds. So the latency is, is less than five milliseconds. And in home scenarios, we typically talk about multi-hop networks, like a whole home Wi-Fi, and over the unlicensed band. So that is a really interesting challenge, and my team is working on a lot of interesting things to enable just that. Today in this talk, I will talk more about the sixth sense. So how do we get to the ambient intelligence? And this is, the, this is the next part of my talk. And I will actually show you in the next few minutes that there is an interesting symbiosis between connectivity and sensing. So both of them go very nicely together. And let's start first. Luckily, actually, a lot of the people that we are interested in carry smartphones. A lot of the objects that we are interested in are connected. So that means when devices are connected to our network, we actually can look at where are those devices. And for example, if I have an autonomous robot that costs $30,000, I would like to be able to know with centimeter precision where that robot is. If a person carries a smartphone, I would like to know with submeter precision where the person is so that I can do indoor navigation, I can track the people, I don't know in which room they are, and so on. And Especially in enterprise use cases, I'm interested in a lot of, uh, for example, equipment. Where is my equipment? Where are my assets? Where are my goods? And I don't want to put, strap a smartphone on all those objects, but uh, I would like to use low-cost tags, for example, based on Bluetooth Low Energy or even RFID. And still, I would like to know in which room the things are, and sometimes even with submeter precision where exactly they are. And then, of course, if you think about it, um, so even if a person does not carry a smartphone, I would like to still know where the person is in which room, so that if you talk to your voice assist, I can turn on the right lights for you. So this is the, the ambition that we have. And in the following, I will show you a few technologies, how we uh, get there. 
the principles are actually pretty simple. So here the white dots that you can see there is, for example, the person carrying a smartphone. The smartphone is transmitting. And then I have multiple access points inside the room, and they receive the signal. If I synchronize those access points, I can get the time difference when the signal arrives, and I can triangulate that, that device that was transmitting. The same thing that I do with time of arrival, I can do with angle of arrival. So if I have multiple antennas, I can estimate the direction from which the signal is coming from. And if I have two access points, I can know where exactly that transmitter was. And this works perfectly in line of sight. And the next thing which is actually really interesting with uh, 5G and with Wi-Fi next generations, we increase the bandwidth of, the, of those radios. So we increase the time resolution so we can get more accuracy in, in estimating the time of arrival. And also, we get massive MIMO. We have 8, 16, 32 antennas. So we can get very accurate angular information from where the signal comes from. And those methods work really well in perfect line of sight. However, the challenge is that the reality is typically not that nice. So sometimes you have a reflection, for example, close to the device or close to the access point. So that means you cannot really resolve that multipath. So it will distort your received signal. Your measurement, you will get the bias. Or you have objects and people blocking the line of sight path. And so the challenge is really, how do I build a, a high accuracy positioning system in such a real environment? And of course, this is uh, one of the research topics in my team. We have done exactly that. And I will demonstrate how we use this together with an autonomous robot. So how we can help the robot with our high accuracy indoor positioning system, which in that space achieves a median accuracy of 30 centimeter. And at the 99th percentile, we have one meter accuracy in positioning. And it actually um, uses Bluetooth low energy as the radio. So we wanted to build something which is allowing us to track low cost devices. And as I said before, so basically we, I will demonstrate how this works with a robot. So you will see something that we have in our future X lab in New Jersey in, in the headquarter of Bell Labs. So this is the robot moving down a pre-planned path towards a factory. So that's a mock-up of a factory. And next we will see how that movement looked in the high accuracy indoor positioning system. So you can see it's actually able to track that robot pretty nicely uh, when it goes down the path. It has about 30 centimeter accuracy. And the robot basically gets this location as an initial guess of where am I. Then it has a map of the building. And the white dots that you can see there is actually what the LiDAR of the robot sees. And with that initial guess, it can very easily, uh, the, the LiDAR algorithms converge, and it can estimate its position with centimeter accuracy. It knows the pose where it is exactly. It can calculate the trajectory. And with all of that, it can navigate even in complex environments, so like this. And so here it is basically driving into the factory, turning around. And this video is a bit hectic because we speed it up by four times. And the reason for that is it still cannot look around corners. So we have to go slow when we, for example, go through doors and so on. So this is really um, demonstrating how we use the localization system, how it can be used together with robots. But in the same way, we track people, we track assets. So that's the first part. Um, and the challenge here really is for the research community as well, how do we make those things work in real environments? And the second challenge, if you look for something, is how can we make this work with a minimal amount of infrastructure? So that, for example, we have the same amount of locators that what we today have in our Wi-Fi deployments, for example. So this is still some open research challenges if you want to look at this. Next is, of course, we said before, we don't want to limit ourselves to just the moments when we carry a device. But we would still like to be able to have a, our home as a safe place to, for example, that the light goes on when I enter with my basket. I would like to be able to detect anomalies, like if a person falls. I would like to be able to track if there is somebody in the building that is, shouldn't be there, so intruders. And the last thing is also very interesting. If a person is static, um, I, can also, I would also like to measure the vital signs, the heart rate, for example, and all of that without variables. 
So that would be my dream of a future space. And in all those areas, actually, people are doing research, experimenting with using RF for that. So uh, my team, for example, has developed a proof of concept that you can use radar to extract the heart rate of a person sitting. So it actually works pretty well when you're static. Um, and the other thing that where the research community is very active is using the Wi-Fi signal itself uh, to, for example, support all of those use cases. And next I will show you how this typically works. So those research groups would have a Wi-Fi router, would have a laptop. They, uh, when the, the router transmits packets which are received at the laptops, the laptops look at the channel state information. So it looks at the physical layer signal that it receives. And if you think about it, the signal doesn't just travel straight from my laptop to the access point, but it's actually reflected off the objects in the room. And if the person is moving, I will see variations in the received signal strength. And the, the idea of those researchers was like, how much information is really in those reflections? Can I, for example, extract if there is a person that is sitting, standing, can I detect movement like somebody standing up, sitting down, walking? And it turns out you can. So that is like a, a lot of papers you will see that they can do this with about 90% accuracy to even detect gestures or track a person typing on, on the keyboard, which is very interesting. And, and uh, of course, the thing that they usually don't tell is that um, they collect the data in, let's say, a day of experiments five, six hours, and they always have the, the, the router and the laptop in the same position. And they use part of the data to basically train your machine learning network. They use then a part of the data to validate it, and then they test it on the remaining data. But all of that was the same link. So we did an experiment if you actually change the link. So let's say you do this experiment tomorrow again. You again place the router in a different place. You place the laptop in a different place. This is what you get. The accuracy of predicting those movements might drop to something like 22%, which is just a little bit better than guessing. <laughs> and now you might ask yourself is, why don't you just collect more data? And this is really where the difficulty is. So you have your Wi-Fi access point, you have your laptop, you collect the data, and this is what the data looks like. So that is a person that is sitting there, then standing up, walking around, sitting down again, standing up, walking around. I cannot just do it with images where I give it to people and say, put the boundary box and label what the person is doing. This doesn't work for the channel state information. This doesn't work for the received signal strength, or the variations in the received signal. And the other thing which is also is that um, those platforms are typically uh, evaluation platforms. They are hacked platforms, so they are not very stable. So it's actually painful to collect the data. And really what we see is the, there is a lack of, of large data sets that would enable all these innovations that we have been talking about. And this is really, I think, what I would like to take with you from this talk is if we want to make progress in this area, really I think we have to figure out a way on how to create big labeled data sets that we can use to train those machine learning networks and really see if we can get all of that out, what we think we might be able to do. So can we, where is the limit, where is the ceiling of what we can detect from the received signal? And maybe just to tease a little bit, so we have actually collected 10 times more data than you usually have, and we did that for a lot of link locations, so we were varying the positions of transmitter receivers inside the room and we have done the same experiment again. And what we can see is actually that the accuracy increased from 22% to, for an unseen link to 70%. And if you look at the details, which looks very promising to me, and not surprisingly, the, the machine learning network had the biggest challenge in basically distinguishing between sitting and standing, which are both stationary movements. And if you haven't seen the link before, that is, it's very intuitive that uh, that is actually um, becoming a problem for the network. But on the other hand, it's, we can pretty well establish between standing up and sitting down. And so we feel that with increasing amount of data, we can actually learn much more from the received signal. And then also if you think about the era of 5G, we will have 
millimeter wave communication, we start to have signals with 80 megahertz bandwidth, 160. Next generation Wi-Fi will have 320. 5G and 28 gigahertz will have 400 megahertz bandwidth. And YGIG has two gigahertz going up to four gigahertz. And the number of antennas, let's say four and eight are commonplace today. We will increase it maybe to 16 with the next generation of Wi-Fi. So that means that we will get much more rich information from in the received signal of the radio. And I'm actually very excited about what we can do with that. And we are still beginning in the beginning of to explore what's possible. And now to, to wrap up. So basically, this is the future, how I see it, of indoor networks. So the first thing is seemingly infinite capacity. I would like to give you gigabit in your whole home with low latencies for immersive multimedia and for um, edge cloud connected robots. And we will develop a sixth sense, an ambient intelligence that will give some context to those voice assists so that they work better, more intuitive. We can also use that for health and, and monitoring of people inside the space. And the final thing, which is, I think, Kathy very nicely already hinted towards that for all of this to work, we have to keep in mind, of course, trust. So if I start to automate actions, uh, I need to trust that the door doesn't open for somebody who shouldn't be in the house. I, my fridge should not start ordering milk when I go on vacation. Um, then I put there the, the robot butler. Butlers are very discreet, so we also want our smart in, ambient intelligence to be discreet. There are moments where we don't want to be filmed. And also, it's really important to, to uh, get the user experience right so that people understand what is my home doing. So why is it now playing a different music because I'm there with my kids versus if I'm by myself? So there is a lot of these things where I think that um, there will be years and years of research going in there until we really have the products that get this right. So with that, I would like to end my talk, and thank you very much. A big round of applause. Klaus Doppler.